my name is Katya Woods. I'm with Stacey Vaughn and Monica Gleberman, and we are talking Bridgerton once again, but this time we're talking Queen Charlotte. But before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about our members and why is it that you wanted to be on the show talking things Bridgerton, um, or in this case, Queen Charlotte. Let's start with you, Stacey. My name is Stacey Vaughn. I'm in the Hollywood Critics Association. I've been a big fan of Bridgerton for a while, and I think it was the second season that really cemented my love. I could not stand Anthony <laughs> during the first season. I couldn't stand him. And I said, oh, the second season's going to be about him. Boo. And then I fell so hard in love with that second season. It was Kate Sharma's my everything. I love that season. And so when I heard that they were going to do a uh, background on Queen Charlotte, I was like, sign me up. I'm ready. What about you, Monica? Tell the people a little bit about yourself and what made you become a fan of this series. My name is Monica Gleberman. I'm an ACA member and I'm so excited. I heard that we were doing Queen Charlotte as a show. I love Bridgerton. I read all the books. I was super excited. There was a lot of hype for that first season, a lot of pressure. I think on Shauna, she delivered. But what I really enjoyed was the difference between the first season and the second season in terms of depicting romance and the ways that she did it and the challenges and the different moves to make them very different. But then when Queen Charlotte came out um, for us and to watch it for that tone to be even different and even more, you know, in a different realm and genre than she did in the prior two seasons of Bridgerton, I was like, got to talk about it because it's just groundbreaking. Like each season that she does, whether it's connected or not connected, you know, to the, to the Bridgerton family necessarily is just groundbreaking in the romantic way. Like they're all told in different romantic ways that just suck you in and like, and then you just want to watch it a million times. So I was like, I got to do it. Got to be here. <laughs> got to talk about it. Well, if you know anything about me, know that I love romance novels and Julia Quinn is one of my all-time favorites. And I have read these books usually on an air, uh, on a flight because, you know, the East Coast to West Coast is five hours and also no one can interrupt me. So like all of us, I was like, yes. And let's get into it a little bit. When we last saw Queen Charlotte, she was doing what she usually does, trying to, you know, finagle the world, trying to marry people off, trying to make sure, and also entertain herself with the lives of her subject. Because let's be honest, she likes pulling the strings and she likes seeing things go left and right because it amuses her along with her trusted friend, Brinsley. So what is it that is different from what we've seen to what we can expect. We're getting to know Queen Charlotte before she became this very strong, brim, and sometimes a little bit bitter, but still amusing woman. Let's start with that. What is it that you want to share with our viewers about when we first meet Queen Charlotte? She wasn't even Queen Charlotte. She was Lady Charlotte. Let's start with you, Monica. Well, the biggest thing that I wanted to know was, you know, when you're watching Bridgerton and you're seeing how she is, she's very alone. And for someone to be very alone and not really with her husband and you don't, you're, you're learning bits and pieces about him. If you've never read the books and we're, you know, you're just watching the show, there's a lot that you don't really know. And she's so infatuated with love and having, you know, couples get together. So for me, right away, when I, when there was a story coming out that was going to tell you how did she fall in love, where, what is her husband about, how did that whole you know story happen, I wanted, I right away I went, oh my gosh, these are the gaps. This is what I want to know. I want to know how did that happen and why did that lead her to want to love love so much and want to make everybody that she's around fall in love and live, you know, happily. Although she does have moments, <laughs> very strong moments on the show uh, where she could be very specific and very demanding. Again, those are personality traits that I think we don't know why. And any type of kind of prequel spinoff, something to tell about her growing up, I think fill in those gaps. So it was, it was basically selfishly for me to have some of my questions answered. <laughs> about her because I love her as a character. 
Absolutely agree 100%. What about you, Stacey? What do you think, uh, what were you thinking when you first saw her appear on the screen? And what is it that you feel like you learned about her as a young woman? I thought spot on, 100%. The second I saw her, because it's not just the look. It's her mannerisms. She gets, she has a very specific gait. She has a very specific kind of way of talking, a way of doing things. And it's not a facsimile of the queen, but it does inform. It is the queen just several decades before, you know, and you can kind of see how the queen got into these ways. Um, one thing I did notice, I rewatched season one and two before watching Queen Charlotte. And I noticed that anytime someone came with news about the king, she would say, is he dead? Did he die? <laughs> and I was like, queen, like, what is that? You know, and so I love that in the series, I wa really wanted to dive into that and see what that came from. And I think that we got that in Queen Charlotte. I was exactly the same. Every time that she said, is he dead? I was like, why does she not like him? What's going on? What's happening? Like, cause we didn't know. So I was just like, is, is it bad? Is it good? Um, you know, would she be happy? Is she going to be upset? And there was just no real kind of, we just didn't know. We had no idea. Um, so yeah, having this story being told now, I feel like you get the idea as to why. And then you're like, uh, you know, and then it, leave it a shot and it just like your heart, you know, like, so now I'm just like, oh no. So like if there's a, you know, for season three, if I hear any of those statements, I feel like my heart's going to break now right. after watching you know, this whole Queen Charlotte. But I was just like, you, I was like, is it good? Bad? What's going on? <laughs> I didn't I know. I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure. I agree. Let's talk about the young woman that is portraying her. I want to make sure I'm going to say her name correctly. India Amar Terfio. If you guys know it, I apologize if I butchered that, but India, let's just go with her first name. I thought one of the things that made this work as, cause we already know older Queen Charlotte was, I feel like India did a very good job of studying the mannerism. So it was consistent. Like, because one thing about Queen Charlotte makes her so fun to watch are the facial expressions. Her side eye is everything. Like she doesn't say anything. Like if she doesn't approve of you or she doesn't like you, if she don't mess with you, it's all here. It's all in the face. And I feel like India did a really, really, really good job. Uh, can we talk about that? Because I think we would have been disappointed had they gotten somebody who would have played her more internally. Um, I Let's think for instance, when they first meet, her and George first meet, and she doesn't know it's George. And just that is something that I feel like she, that makes sense for choosing how she made those choices. So can you start off with that a little bit, Stacey, talk about how India picked up all those mannerisms. I thought that India did a fantastic job. It's so funny. I saw her at the premiere and she really is, you know, she's very put together, very poised. But there and there is something about Charlotte where, you know, she comes from royalty, but it's a smaller kingdom. It's not, you know, the empire of Great Britain at that time. And so she has her customs. She has the confidence to be like, I'm uncomfortable and I'm going to make that known. But she doesn't have the working knowledge and the life lived yet to know how to go about addressing that. And there is something in her, even in her innocence, she seems well-learned. And so it's hard to kind of imagine her as being, uh, being a child, but India puts it off so well. And I think another reason why this works so well is because she studied Golda and was like, okay, I can bring my own essence to it, but at the same time, I have to keep some things to the same. So the viewers aren't like, feeling like it's disjointed between the two women. Yes. I mean, like for starters, I have to give props to the casting overall, because I mean, it was so impressive to see how much they all looked like them. Like everyone, all the younger versions of them. I mean, it, it was incredible, but for India in particular, the fact that she had to come in and we meet her and the focus 
is very much on her. We need to fall in love with her. We need to like her. We need to understand her. And we need to kind of, in a way, separate her from what we've seen as Queen Charlotte, right? As the adult. We need to separate that. She has to accomplish all of that while looking like her and coming from a different country wanting to you know get married but then not wanting to get married <laughs> and trying to figure out all of those things like us women like you know kind of struggle with and in a time where she doesn't have much say but is vocal right so she has to like struggle as an actor even with all of these things and to accomplish all of that in the first four minutes so that we're sold to say i want to know what happens to her i want to hear the story how do you do that i don't know but she did it. <laughs> it's like she nailed it. And um, when I like spoke to her, I asked that and she just, she was so like nonchalant about it. And I was like, come on, girl, you did a lot of work. Like, don't, don't play. Like you did. And she was like, all right. She's like, I did. And she, you know, and she really spent the time and it shows because I said the same thing to her. If, if we did not fall in love with you in the first two minutes, the show doesn't work. We need to fall in love with you. We need to want to know you. As, as someone younger, as young, as young, you know, Charlotte, as the young queen before she's queen, right? And so she just, I mean, it's just so impressive how she does that and captivates you. And I, I would think, I, we probably all agree, that in the first five, ten minutes, I think it's like, all right, where's the next episode? Next episode, like, you're just in because she's so believable and she does such a great job. And, and I also love Stacey, you mentioned the struggles, like, you know, with coming from another country, she's, she's kind of queen, but not, you know, she's not like a royalty as much to a, to a larger extent as she's going to become and to step into mm -hmm. that role and step into it with so much pressure on her shoulders. Um, it was also fun to watch because she was a woman. Because a lot of times when we watch these shows, when that happens in these period pieces and they're nervous and they're coming from another country, the man tends to be the one making the decisions. And then the woman's kind of like the voice behind the man. This show does the opposite where it's like the man's like, I don't really know. I'm not really sure. And then the woman's like, oh, no, no, no. you're going to do this. And she comes in and she just fires through. So India nailed it. And Queen Charlotte, I think the whole kind of story to get us invested, kind of nailed it. And Katya, Absolutely. you mentioned this earlier about the idea that she wasn't saccharine. She wasn't like, oh, I'm going to get you to like me by being super sweet and, and approachable and likable. She's like, no, I'm going to be 100% my, myself. She is nothing but Charlotte in there. And that's one of the reasons that it works. And that's why people do end up rooting for her and wanting to see more. There's a couple of things I think that I, I think that Shonda made sure. I think being a black woman behind this thing and having a black woman lead, she gave her agency. She gave her nuance and she didn't make her feel that she needed to be perfect. Cause we know that as black women, we always have to have a brave front no matter what. And I like the fact that Charlotte was able to say, this sucks. And this is not, a, you know, she, I was I was very happy to see her say that to her brother and the whole situation. And also, you know, as you see her throughout the show, having to tackle certain things and her being like, I understand why, but it still sucks. You know what I mean? Which I think is not very normal to see women during that time. I mean, if you see um, other women, you know what I mean? It shows that center of women and you're like, but girl, you know, you don't like this. Why are you acting like it's a good time? You'll do it because tradition dictates it. But if you don't like it, say you don't like it. You know what I mean? Queen Charlotte is a young woman coming to terms with, you know, entering this marriage. It's going to be a done deal. She's not thrilled about it, but, you know, she's going to put her big girl pants on and do what is required of her. Someone else we get to meet, that someone that I love, which is Lady Danbury. She is regal. She is smart. She is elegant and, like the queen, likes to play love matches. But here we get to meet her as a young woman. We get to find out how she came into her wealth. And again, the casting was spot on. Let's talk about her when we first meet her in a very um, 
dare we say, compromising position. Let's start with you, Stacey. Arsima Thomas is a revelation. She's so sweet and she's so good in this role. She, um, when we see Lady Danbury and Bridgerton, we know that she has been widowed, but we don't really know a lot about how she came to her station. And when we see her, she's in a, a, a head knocking situation. <laughs> That is causing a horizontal mumbo jumbo, as we may exactly. say. <laughs> <laughs> and she is um, otherwise preparing correspondence in her mind, thinking about plans for later. You know, she's great at multitasking. So we know from the jump, she's got skills. <laughs> and it's only a matter of time before we see those come to fruition. Monica, <laughs> thoughts as we meet Lady Barry in. <laughs> a very um not compromising position but not as she would say enjoyable position so this is my take on it when we first meet her i think my face was like this <laughs> i like, like, totally dropped out and i was like what um but i instantly felt sad for her because mm -hmm. you can see on her face you know obviously there's not it's not an enjoyment it's a clearly kind of like an unrequited strategic move and i can't you know you can't blame her for it i mean like i think a lot of women in that time made very smart strategic moves to get what where they ultimately wanted to be i think the biggest thing that that scene showed me was not only that i felt bad that she had to be put in that position to get herself to where she wanted to ultimately be but i was it helped me understand her as an adult for wanting to be like, I'm good. Like I have my time with my, you know, with the men when I feel like it, you know, as an adult and, but I'm sufficient on my own. I worked hard to be here and, and I'm good. And I think I have a lot more respect and understanding that I did not know watching the first two seasons by seeing her here. One thing that's really interesting about her is that we learned that she, hers was an arranged marriage because her father-in-law was royalty. So she was a person who was set up to go with, you know, the prince. And, um, and you know, we'll talk more about that later. But I like the idea that she really didn't care for the royalty of it all. Not until her husband started caring and she was like, all right, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right. And that's when we really see her coming to her own as a uh, a move maker, as someone who can get in there and and make um, deals and kind of you know low key blackmail some people and all that good stuff. So yeah, she it really was her origin story, and it was fantastic. She is the original. Um, how can I say this? She's not showing up for the class photo. <laughs> You're not about to use us and to say that you're for the colors and not have us get all of the benefits of that. But let's drill down a little bit. We talked about a little bit being sad, and I don't think, I mean, though this fiction is fictional, and obviously this is like a novella, right? We also have to remember that that part is true. As women, mm -hmm. there were very limiting choices. You know, uh, especially when it came to sexuality, it was very common for a man like a certain age. I don't want to say that Lord Lord Barry was old, but he was like granddaddy <laughs> old. You know what I mean? And the reason he wanted a young wife was to produce children. You know what I mean? And and it leads a very insular life, for lack of a better word, and where you know, like his homies are old, old. So. Who is she making friends with? So I think for her, having Charlotte served a purpose for both of them. They found a friendship. The reason they are friends is because they both were in a situation that they were forced into and they saw kinship. And again, both of them were royalty, but they came from smaller areas and they were, how can I say, again, they were viewed as your royalty, but you're not our kind of royalty. So, you know, as new money people, for lack of a better word, again, I think this is how they connected. But I do think unlike Charlotte, 
she figured it out. She understood that these people were never going to like her. So she might as well. And she was like, I don't like them folks either. But I'm going to get everything that I can out of this. And I think in that way, she was smarter than Charlotte, who took a minute to understand how to play the game. I agree with you. And I do, you know, because women, women of the time were so limited in the choices that they can make. And it was like survival, right? So you either got married to survive, you got married to kind of move up, you made strategic, whatever you had to do. What I found very interesting in particular with their friendship is although they're both in the same situation where they didn't have a choice necessarily, I found it interesting that both of them made very strategic, progressive moves that we might not have seen on other television shows and on other, you know, projects, almost acting as if that wasn't done. And that was done. All races, all colors, all genders, everybody did that, made strategic moves and did what they had to do, unfortunately. Some better than others, like, you know, Queen Charlotte has a little bit of a better situation, but they were done. And so to see it depicted in a way where racial, the racial undertones are there, but to show that there were smart women at that time making those strategic decisions to better themselves. And then to not only know that, but to know where the future ends for her, like, you know, like years later that it worked and she did what she wanted to accomplish I think is, again, a masterful thing from Shonda because it's something that on other period pieces they just kind of ignore or pretend didn't exist. But women of that time, again, different races existed and were making those decisions. And so I think the friendship between the two can also rely on the fact that they both want to make strategic decisions, even though they vary in in the type of intent behind them. You know, like Queen Charlotte's looking to you know, help her husband and save certain things and save face and all of those kind of things. Whereas, you know, on the other end, it's more of strategically, how do I get out of this relationship, but also stay, you know, in good standing and uh, continue to support myself as a woman. Um, but I think they relate on that as well. And they kind of help each other through both of that, you know? So I love their friendship and watching it kind of evolve. Yeah. And I think there's love between them. I think, even though it may not have been this passionate affair, she loved him. It's kind of like, you know, the way I feel about my husband, I can make fun of him, but you can't, you know what I mean? And I really, really um, like that aspect of the relationship where she was like, you know, about to have my man out here looking like the court jester, you know, we're going to get him um, set up. And I think that ties into your point, Monica, is that the women knew how to use, you know, everything to their advantage. Even though, let's be honest though, the women really made the progress. The women were running things and just let the men think they were running. Yeah, which I feel like is the only way we could get things done sometimes even today. (laughs) It's like we kind of have to let everybody think that, you know, because it's true, like you can, and I think that's another reason why people really enjoy it. You can literally compare a show that's supposed to take place years ago today and say like let's be real are some of these men you know really making the right well you know there's always a woman there's always someone kind of like not you know nodding in there maybe you should do this so i feel like that's another reason why so many people really just enjoy these shows it's just something where you can escape and watch it and just be like i can relate to that even though it's years ago or i can relate to it for this reason or that reason And, you know, I don't know how Shonda is able to do it where she puts all these layers in to make anyone kind of relate to the show. But I've showed a variety of people, Bridgerton, all ages, ranges, sexualities, gender, you know, the whole thing. And everybody has found something. And that's a rare quality of any type of show, including, you know, when Queen Charlotte comes out and for people to see it. So... (laughs) Let's get on that about identity and gender, which brings me up to my favorite guy, Brimsley. We have Brimsley has a counterpart in Reynolds. And I love speaking once again, people thinking there are certain people are running things, these two little connivers. And I love how they stood up for their people. You know, you know, Brimsley is like, well, she's not the problem. 
it's your guy. Maybe he got a problem. Reynolds is like, he's fine, you know? And I love that they did that. And also to your point, Monica, they just let them be. And we fell in love with the two of them. So I have to ask, whose side were you on, Brimsley or Reynolds, Stacey? I think the key is that their sides are the same. Brim, uh, Reynolds is the king's man. Uh, Brimsley is the queen's man. And so their sides are the same. The problem is that they weren't communicating. And so in that vein, I, I was on Brimsley's side because he just kept saying, look, if you talk to me, we can work this out. We can figure it out. I'm a patriot. I My life is devoted to king and country and the queen, you know, anything that she needs. And your secrecy is making my job hard. <laughs> So let's try to figure something out so we can go back to, you know, getting warm in each other's quarters <laughs> instead of dealing with stuff like this. And I love that we did not see it coming. Like, we were like, oh. that minute they're on the steps, you're like, hold up, what, what? We forgot all about Charlotte and George, and we were like, I clocked it immediately. The second that they showed that, I'm not going to lie. I agree with you. I was like, all right, forget everybody else. What happened? How did you guys meet? Like, I was so invested. I don't know if it was because of how the actors did it, the writing, whatever. The chemistry between them was so adorable. And it was so loving and so beautiful. It was, and like you said, it was as it was, right? We didn't need an explanation. There was no let's defend this, that, the other thing. I hate all of that stuff because we shouldn't have to. It's love. And all we saw was their love. And then the problems of their relationship weren't relationship issues. It was issues with their relationships with the others that they're supposed to be handling, right? Like the king and queen. So I just, there was humor. It was funny. Like to see them like kind of sweat and race around and run and try to fix things. But then at the end of the day, you know, there's like a beautiful scene. One of my favorite, I think, almost in the whole show is between the two of them. And even after all of their fighting and everything that kind of goes on and all of kind of the scheming to try to get the, the queen and king to talk to one another and be on the same side, they, they get into an argument. And I was nervous and I went, oh, no, like, I really want them together. Like, no, don't let this break them up. And all you see them do is standing next to each other and just graze hands. Yeah. And they, like they just and I just went ah! and I side, you know, like it was just it was it was beautiful it was perfect i love the amount of time they gave to it it wasn't brushed off it wasn't quick it was a nice beautiful gorgeous love story that was happening on top of a love story that we're learning about and i just i i just could not have been more interested in it if i had to choose a side it would be brimsley because i do agree i think he was a little more open to the communication but i will say that you know for the king's men i do understand where he's coming from because of the circumstances, he was being very protective because of what was going on. And he didn't want people to know. And I think he didn't, he was nervous to communicate, which is what that fight sparks because something comes out, you know, that sparks that argument. But I think, you know, in the end, seeing them together, I just loved it. And I want to see them together now, like on Bridgerton and, you know, and like, we and need to, yeah, we need to eat what's happened. That's what we I need. Know. right? I want to know. Yeah. I want to know everything. Like, cause what was so sad and like, I you know, I don't, on that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if like, you know, we'll get to that point. I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but what was sad is we see Brimsley older, right? We've seen him in season one and two. So we see him older and, but we don't see really him in a relationship. So now I'm like all concerned, <laughs> like what happened and is he still there? And if he like, you know, are they not together? Or... So now I'm, I'm, I'm down to Shonda rabbit hole, basically. And I just yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. We all are, right? I was going to say that um, the hand brush thing, that's a Bridgerton staple and she does it every season and it works every single time. It is so good. It's so simple and it's so loud without being kind of overt. 
Um, I did have the, the pleasure of speaking with Sam and uh, Freddie at the premiere. Sam plays Brinsley and then Freddie plays Reynolds. And I was like, so what What are your thoughts about what happens to Reynolds? You know, I was like, where is he? And, some, and so Sam was like, oh, I think he's probably still in the basement with the king. <laughs> you know? And then Freddie was like, oh, well, if he's not dead, then maybe he's traveling. And I was like, come on, guys. So we're going to cross our fingers for a season two. <laughs> we can get yeah, some I know. Me. I mean, and- I think, yeah, I mean, we'll learn. But speaking of that, speaking of the king, there's so much going on with this poor man. Oh, poor George. Let's start in how we meet him. He, of course, like all Bridgerton men, was, you know, kissed by the sun gods. He is handsome. He is poised. You know, I don't think they have ugly people in that kingdom. But (laughs) we meet him and... I love how he kind of like too goes along with Charlotte and she's like, give me a hand. And he's like, Hmm. <laughs> you know, Instead of him being like, silly girl, you know, you're supposed to marry me. He's like, well, at least I know this marriage is not going to be dull. She's interesting. Right. But we learn, we know from the first two seasons of Bridgerton that King George has some issues, right? Yeah. We're not quite sure. Because when we see him, we don't know if it's dementia. We don't, we just see him. He's always very befuddled and we know he's older. So I think a lot of us just chucked it up as an old age, right? Mm-hmm. But in I this just, show, Queen Charlotte, yeah. we learn that it isn't, you know? And sadly, during that time, they treated mental illness, mental challenges in the most awful ways. So let's talk a little bit about who George is. We know he's a dreamer. We know he's a scientist. We know he's a scholar. But because of how society was, he was made to believe he had to hide all of himself, especially to his wife. Let's start with that, Monica. When we first meet him, he's beautiful. The sun's hitting him. You know, he's standing. Queen Charlotte's trying to hop over a wall. She's beautiful. So, I mean, like, they have this beautiful, like, meet cute moment, right? And they just instantly, and again, this is another moment that I'm talking about where it has to work, right? You have, like, the two-minute, three-minute conversation where this needs to make us believe it. And they do, you know? Like, the, the riffing off of each other and the conversations that have make work. But what I found so interesting about him were the fact that he is interested in education. He is interested and way more than just being a a figurehead, right? And he loves the stars and loves, you know, everything astronomy and science and math and all of these things. And although he's told to hide them because a king needs to be focused on a country, right? And he, you know, these other things don't matter. I think that leads him into feeling that he needs to hide that there's something that he feels is wrong. Like something's just not right. Like something's off. And again, this is another trope of what they show with mental health. A lot of times we're, you know, if you have anxiety or if you have anything, you're felt to hide it, that it's taboo, that it's not right, that there's something wrong with you. And there's nothing wrong with him. And the fact that they have to, you know, that there, there's nothing wrong with him in terms of that, it couldn't have been fixed maybe with some therapy, maybe with some help, but the fact of the time period and the way that they tried to treat him is awful and watching it is awful. And then it also reminds you that hundreds and millions of other people went through that, which is even worse. So to bring in mental health into this kind of spinoff show, I thought was really brave thing to do because you're showing these horrible things that we all did to each other to quote fix something you know versus working through it in the more humane way but nobody knew any better you know um but i I find it sad that he loved all of these things and i think it would have made him a better king but because he was told to hide so much then he hides kind of everything and by doing that it leaves queen charlotte very alone and very confused until she finds out what's going on and the, when she does, it's like, oh, she should have known so much earlier. Because if she did, I think she still would have moved forward. I, I think she still would have been with him. But she would have been able to help him. And I don't think he would have suffered as much as he did. And so that that killed me, like watching that as a romantic. Watching that and seeing him suffer so much. And then he does it for her, 
too, which is even worse because you're like, oh, like just tell her because she'll be there for you. You know, like we're, she would do anything for you. And um, so that was like rough to kind of go through his whole storyline. But um, Kathy, like you were saying, we didn't know much. So to kind of see what happened, um, made it was bittersweet. You know, it's a like miracle. the man wasn't wasn't more disturbed. All the stuff that he went through. I mean, like it really is a miracle that he is presented the way he is in the first two seasons of the virtue because his brain should be fried, like literally. Yes. <laughs> it was scary, like what they did. It was really scary. But I, yeah. but again, I like that she brought in like in a in a short show of six episodes. How you bring in multiple romantic stories, address women, sexuality race and then on top of that mental health i i don't know how you do it but she did it in a way where it wasn't overwhelming it wasn't preachy it was more like educational and at times scary that these are things that we did to other people or these are things that people at that time had to kind of live through um so i mean i just love george but i just uh poor george i just i feel for him so much you know and um i guess you know we'll get closer to talking about the ending but it was just a very bittersweet for me Kind of finally figuring out what it was that was wrong. So Can we talk about how Michelle Fraley played his mother? I know we're talking all things um, Queen Charlotte, but she's on another show called uh, Gangs of London. And if you have never seen that show, that woman plays scary, not nobody's business. I'm sure she is lovely in the real world, but by God, <laughs> this woman. As soon as I saw her, I was like, oh, that explains why that poor boy would never see. <laughs> like, talk about that part, Stacey, because she was like the puppet master and she was the one that helped, you know, make him feel like that. I don't think that she was a villain. One thing that was that uh was very interesting that you mentioned, Monica, was about uh Charlotte and the way that she decided to handle him. I think um, I liked at the beginning, she said, you know, I don't care if you're an ogre or a monster. What bothers me is not knowing. And so that, you know, he, I wish he would have confided in her. Um, that is also another runner in Bridgerton where they have these things where if they would just confide them, it would be okay. But because of the times, it's not going to be allowed to happen. Just like when Colin told Marina, if you would have just told me you're pregnant, I would have married you instantly. But it's like, there's no world in which she ever would have been able to tell you. You know, it just, it doesn't, it, it doesn't. It's heartbreaking. Click. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. Exactly. And so when we deal with Jordan, now I um, dis disagree slightly. I think that he definitely had, uh, some sort of mental illness, whether it's schizophrenia or something to that extent. However, I think that the treatment, quote unquote, definitely exacerbated the oh, symptoms. Oh, yes. And it made it so that he seemed crazy, quote unquote, when really it was his body kind of reacting to the severe abuse that he was undergoing. That's why I really liked when Charlotte said, I don't care about his mental health i care about him being happy and what because what she knew is that those are the same thing and that's something that they kind of forgot they were like well in the interest of his mental health we're going to make him as miserable as possible and it's like those don't match up that doesn't work and uh so getting into the michelle Farrelly of it all first of all i was very happy to see her in a series where she didn't die and i was like okay michelle we got gotcha. you and, um, I, you know, I think it would have been very easy to paint her as the villain. And there are some times and some things that she said that were villainous. But I think overall, she cared about George. And she cared about him having, you know, an heir uh, cementing their standing. Because I think they were also still in the time where you could get killed for anything that could be considered treason, including the queen mother, of course. And so um, she was in a very crazy position where she had to make a lot of decisions. Um, a lot of those decisions are wrong, but you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. She thought at the time that she was doing the best thing with the very limited knowledge that she has. And that's another thing. So you were talking about education and 
a lot of these women, specifically uh, uh, the prince and Princess Augusta and um, Lady Danbury, is their educations were gleaned from life experience. So when we have her giving the sex talk to Queen Charlotte, and <laughs> oh God, was it a sex talk? It was, yes. like a, it was like a sex comic. Oh, it was, <laughs> it was fantastic. Really she was talking to Edward and she was like, I'm not really excited about the part where my head keeps hitting the wall. So maybe we can avoid that. He was like, what? What is yeah. that thing, girl? <laughs> I know. And what was it we can say, though? Why, he may not have been all there, George. He handled that part much better. And, and you know, I mean, in that part, they were, they were yoked. It was working out all right, you know. We also see it for the record, though. That scene, I love it so much because she goes, "Do you know what you're like? What you're supposed to do? Like your wedding duties?" And then she, and then Queen Charles, like, "Yeah, like my wedding duty." And the, and it's clear she doesn't know. Well, she's so, like, "Talk I, to me," and she's like, but, "Do you know?" Um, talk to me? Yeah, I know. It's so funny. I know, right? I goes, and uh, we're gonna need a pen and paper. <laughs> know, cool right? and paper, and let me tell you. <laughs> the Kama Sutra on like oh my god and, and here's the thing is you know who could have really helped with that Brimsley and Reynolds because at least they had a clue you know what I mean so I'm like why are we talking to everybody that don't really have a clue and here are two people that can help but I also love the one thing about um all of these shows whether it's Bridgerton or Queen Charlotte I feel like they show the shoot the sex scenes very well. It's sex. It is obviously adult content. If you, it, it's, it's, but it is not like, it's not like a porno. You know what I mean? They take into account the woman's feelings, the man's feelings. They don't just, you know, cause normally the women are booty naked and the men are like, you know, as if like women don't want to see booty and other things. And they take into account that. They take into account of making sure that the women are enjoying themselves and that they're being treasured and pleasured. And it's not, um, and the men you know, we live in a world right now where everybody got a problem with everybody's sexuality. And, um, but it's very done loving. It's sensual. The thing that I love most about all of this is that even though they have these challenges, these two people, do fall in love and they are fond of each other. And I think George not wanting Charlotte to know what's wrong with him is not because he's um, ashamed of her. It's because he feels as though she's too good for him. He doesn't want her to know that she really is the one. She may have married a king, but she's, she's in for a very long and heavy haul, which brings us to the other part of this which is also a fun part because again love queen charlotte they done had all these kids and you mean to tell me nobody can produce a male heir like it's a lot of children in here <laughs> what did she say horse well, like, the, have to horse to left virgins to the right, right, and that was right? The they, and, she and I'm, she's just like she is fed up she's like you mean to tell me i done had all these children and none of y'all can get a wife uh some type of baby boy out of this. I love that because again, that is a serious issue for a monarchy, for a country. It's a reflection upon her. And I love the fact that they put humor into it. And here you have Queen Charlotte, who's been connecting everybody. She throws the ball. She's making sure everybody's married to everybody. And she can't get it right in her own family. Maybe that's why she takes so much enjoyment in other people's lives. Because it's a mess in her family. Talk about that, Stacey. Because her kids seem to be very confused about what the mission is. <laughs> well, that I love that part of it. Because it does show ways that our Charlotte has changed. You know, Charlotte was like, I can't believe that the only thing I'm good for is to make babies. And then we have Queen Charlotte being like, the only thing y'all are good for is to make me a baby. You know, your life does not start until you make me a baby. The problem is she had 50, up to 50 grandkids, you know, but they were all illegitimate. And so it, it brings so many different things and customs and ways into question the uh, ways that they choose to do these things. But I really, really um, enjoyed that part of it. But it was also very heartbreaking because um, 
we learned that when we start up her her firstborn son prince george his wife died in child bearing and so not only did he lose his wife he lost his child as well and she's like you know sorrows sorrows prayers you know and but and it's it's funny but it's also heart-wrenching because later on um she asked brimsley like why do you think my daughter's never married and ultimately he's like they couldn't leave you alone you know you're alone here like even though dad is still alive you are stuck you are frozen in this state and she never really took time to consider that and then we learn about the one daughter who had two miscarriages and charlotte being like oh you know like oh my god this is happening and my palace walls have become too high essentially. Yeah. And so I thought it was an excellent companion piece to put with what we were going through because you saw the ways in which she kind of forgot who she was a little bit and kind of coming back and refinding that. But in all fairness, though, I think she too had to do certain things in order for her to push forward, right? I think, first of all, dealing with her husband's condition dealing with her role because she is a symbol she's basically running the country because he can't and she has to assume all those things so she never got the opportunity to be this doting mother because the role just doesn't allow for that you know what i mean it just didn't you have to be the stiff upper lip but at the same token why she didn't marry for love initially um, she didn't instill in her kids, you know, as horrible as it may sound like, Hey, your mission, your number one mission is to keep this lineage going. Who's going to govern like, hello. And at the same time, she also realized why she wasn't trying to be so harsh. She also created the situation by not putting her foot down and being more demanding of them. It's like you said, Stacey, there were a lot of illegitimate kids because they were out here just being messy. Well, <laughs> but, <laughs> but at the same token, she needed to do what was done for her, have these marriage arrangements and then strengthening the monarchy, but at the same time, continuing the lineage. And she kind of like woke up one day and was like, snap, like we didn't do none of that. And now she's like, go forth and find a wife. And the kids are like, wait a minute, since when do you want to care about that? Since always. But I do think um, her as a mother versus her as a leader is really hilarious. Like one is very strong. The other one is kind of like, she's hustling backwards, basically. She's playing catch up. And Brinsley really is there like, girl, I've been trying to tell you, but you don't always listen. Did you we guys mentioned have something extremely important about her and her idea of love. She did love George and she probably does still love George, but I think for her, love and pain go a little more hand in hand than what we know. And of course, for Lady Danbury, we see her telling Violet, you know, you're, you, Edmund lives in your heart, my husband rots in mine. I had no love for him. And we know that Lady Van Danbury does discover love, but it's with someone who is inappropriate at the time. You know, we can't deal with that. And so I, I liked that she tells her child, she's like, love isn't something that you happen into by magic. You have to work on it and you have to create it yourselves and together. And I think that a part of her, you kind of mentioned this at the very beginning, but I think there is a little bit bitterness that she's like, I don't really have that. And I don't, so it's not something that I expect my kids to have because I have no example to give them of what it is. Um, to like build on that too, you know, in terms of pain for her, when she got married and obviously she's pushing through, right. And she gets pregnant and she's all excited on the show. When you find out that they had 18 children, we don't see the 18 children, you know, over the years. So, I mean, that takes a toll on a woman let alone having to deal with a husband that's not that might not be able to be there for you all the time. I definitely think she loves him without a doubt, specifically with that last scene. Um, so I don't think it's a question of love. I think she does everything because she loves him. I I just think when you have 18 children and you're kind of left on your own with help, you know, in the cat, you know, castle, you know, in their in their house or whatever. 
I think that takes a toll on you and you start viewing things a little differently and you might not be the best mom because you can't run around and you don't know what to do and you're handling a country and you're trying to do all these decisions. But at the same time, I found a huge comparison to her and King George's mom because when she walked into that room and she's like, okay, chop, chop, enough, enough fooling around, time to get. And that was kind of what, you know, King George's mom was doing. She was saying he's perfect. She was in denial, you know, like obviously there were, you know, mental issues there that had to be addressed that weren't really getting addressed. And when they were, it was not good, but she just kept saying he's perfect. He's perfect. Done. Perfect. Done. And she was just kind of glossing over it. And she just wanted him to be married and have an heir so that life would keep going on for Queen Charlotte at this point in her life. When we see her, we don't really meet and learn that much about her kids one-on-one, you know, we don't learn a lot of their, you know, personalities because it's not meant for that. It's meant for her to come in and really show that transposition between her being young versus old, that change. And then her kind of a comparison between King George's mom Mm -hmm. and kind of walking in and saying, listen, time's done. I need somebody let's go. And she's kind of just like, let's go, let's get on it. And I, when she did that at first, my first initial reaction was kind of like, Ooh, this is so weird because how did this happen? Like, you know, she started off so differently, but then when I really started to think about it and think about 18 kids and think about how many times <laughs> pregnant and the downfall, and, you know, and how fast her, you know, cause even in the very beginning when they first get married, how fast King George kind of starts downfalling with his mental health the ins and outs and when he's kind of cohesive and he's there and when he's gone, how to deal with that for years and years, whether, and obviously got worse and to be on your own. I mean, God, that must've been so difficult. So for her to come in, I do think, yes, there's like a cold moment there, but I think she has that same fear that King George's mom had, which was, I did all of this. I was in love. I went through so much. You guys, you kids will never understand what I gave you. The least you could do is make sure we continue this for our family. And so that seems to me. So like when I, I think initially when people see it, they might go, Oh, she's being so mean. But if you really think about it, if you put yourself in that position, I can't imagine, I would be like super upset and walk in and be like, somebody better take care. Cause I did this for all these years, you know, like, cause she suffered for so long, um, you know, with her husband and alone. And I think it makes perfect sense for her to say, listen, somebody better step up because I've been doing it for you. And they're all like lounging on chairs. They're all joking about these illegitimate children. Like it's no big deal. Like, you know, and she's going, no, like get it together. And we need somebody. She's, to be a you know a parent percent because she's like we're the example yeah well we talked about a lot of things because we still want to keep some surprises for our viewers so before we jump off into our regular lives into being commoners again <laughs> let's talk about what is it that you would like to see we're, we're going to speak it into existence that this is going to be a huge hit and we're going to get season two so we can learn about what happened to Reynolds because we need to know, inquiring minds need to know. Uh, what would you like to see as learn more as she now starts to step into being the, a leader to her people, to her subjects? I have to know what happens with Reynolds. That's like a number one for me. <laughs> I, I want to know what happened um, and if he's still alive and you know, are they what's going on. I need to know what's going on. I need all the details. So I, I want to know that I want to know, um, for queen Charlotte, I would love to see more scenes with her husband. Um, you know, if there was a set, you know, a second one, both young and in current or present, you know, both young, I'll say young and adult, um, uh, Charlotte, I would love to see her with her husband because we don't really in Bridgerton in season one, two, it's kind of scattered. So I would love to see, more scenes of them younger, more of them falling in love, more of them dealing with the stuff that's coming at them. And I would love to see more of kind of over time what happened and why she might be a little more rigid. Cause we, we see it, it's there. We can connect the dots, but we, there's more, there's definitely more to tell. And I would love to kind of see her arc over a period of time and really dealing with it and multiple babies. And like kind of what I was saying before, how she dealt with, you know, a husband that's, you know, in and out kind of thing. And, 
um, all of that. So I would love to see that. Um, and then I guess my the other thing I would like to like manifest out in the world is that hopefully multiple of her kids are not on the whore and the, <laughs> and the other side, the traps on the two sides. And more of her kids, I think, are a little more. I would love to learn more about them and maybe see them, see her be stricter with them and see them be a little more involved into the life that she's in and see them be happy and see her be able to kind of transfer what she puts out to everybody else in the town into her family a little bit more because she's learning. Like even when Brimsley had said like, you you know, you weren't that great of a mom. So when she's like learning all of these things, maybe she'll shift and we can see a little more of her building with her children and then see her children really step in to like what they've been given. So I would love to see more about them and see them have kids and all sorts of stuff. So I'm manifesting a lot for the next season. <laughs> now, uh, Stacey, what would you like to see manifest that, that Monica didn't dwell into? I would say, of course, Reynolds naturally, but um, I want to learn more about Lady Danbury. Um, we know that, you know, her husband dies and we, we see her kind of as a widow, but there is a whole life in the middle of that that she has led. And I want to know every single part. I want to know how she became the Lady Danbury that we know and love. Um, I also want more about the friendship between Lady Danbury and Queen Charlotte. That relationship is so interesting to me. I love, I think that they genuinely love each other. And I think that they challenge each other. And I think Lady Danbury is one of the few people that can make that challenge. Um, I also want to see more about uh, Violet, adding Violet into the mix. I really loved their scenes in her blooming gardens. <laughs> so I want to see if, you know, her blooming garden starts to, you know, grow a little bit more. And um, I agree more scenes with uh, the queen and king. I would definitely like to see Queen Charlotte becoming more a, a ruler, how she governs, you know, because she's going to have to take over those responsibilities due to George's inclining health. Agree on seeing their relationship because I don't think he went full all the way to the left within a matter of minutes. I think we saw that they're normals of Pete. Uh, I don't want to say normalcy, but you know what? He's more himself. Uh, ditto on Reynolds. We need to know. Um, but again, for me, it's to see her handle being a leader, you know, how she's navigating that she's leading a nation, um, how she's coming into that portion of herself and will Lady Bridgerton ever find out what happened between her papa and, oh, I think she um, knows. I mean, does she know? And also, um, well, you know, in this world denial 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 right <laughs> but i do want to know was there perhaps a little bridgerton out there that maybe you know well, a little relative, will he come he or right. she come hither into the fold will we know <laughs> in season two that would be hmm, very interesting well i want to say i had the most fun we could be here all year make sure that you watch Queen Charlotte premiering on Netflix, May the 5th, all six episodes. Put down your phone, put down your phone, get your snacks, get your beverage, get into your comfy clothes. Because ladies, as you know, it's going to be a bumpy ride. We want to hear from you. Do you agree with our assessment? What would you like to see in season two? Did you think that everything was cool or who did you not like? And are you like us? Where is Reynolds? Will we get to see him maybe in season three of Bridgerton? We need to know. Tell us something, because our man Brimsley is looking mighty sad. So having said that, we want to thank you for joining us for this after show. And again, let us know what you want to see next. Thank you so much to Stacy and Monica. We had so much fun. And Stacy, tell everybody where they can find you, your writings, and all that good stuff. You can find me on S -E -Von Creative. that's S-Y-V-O-N-N-E creative.com, uh, Sticky Keys on Instagram and Twitter. What about you, Monica? Where can the good people find you? You guys can find me obsessing over the show <laughs> and everything else. Um, you can find me on Time Warner Ent. It's timewarnerent.com and also Sound Sunset Podcast. 
And you'll find me on Twitter and Instagram at Monica1236. And I'm Katia Woods. You can find my work at CoupleSoulShow.com and at the Philadelphia Tribune. And I'm easy. I'm the same thing on all social media. Katia, K-A-T-H-I-A underscore Woods. Not spelling Woods. We should know that. Like the golfer Tiger Woods. And make sure that you follow the Hollywood's Critics Association on all things social. And stay tuned for more of our after shows and programming. Thank you so much.